Hey everybody, this is Joel Toppin here, and I haven't done a live demo for quite a while. Uh, part of the reason is I had a major move across country, uh, lack of free time to be able to do these things, a uh, very busy work schedule now. Uh, so I'm going to try to do a, um, a recorded demo. So it's not quite the same as doing everything live where I can answer your questions. Uh, of course, we still have the Ventrilo server, so you can still play these multiplayer games uh, online, be able to communicate, whatnot. Uh, but what I'm going to do in this is I'm going to take you through the new game uh, Genesis by Richard Berg and uh, try to teach you how to play this brand new game from GMT Games. Okay, so um, what I've done here is I've gone ahead and set up the game uh, for the main scenario, which is the uh, the grand campaign, if you will. The game packs uh, Romana is kind of like the the parent system for Genesis. So I, I don't I don't really like to call this Pax Genesis, but it uses the the Pax system from Pax Romana. So if you played Pax Romana. Uh, you pretty much know the nuts and bolts of how to play Genesis. You you have the core uh, ideas in mind. There there are enough differences that you will need to read the Genesis rulebook. But what I'm trying to say is that Genesis is a simpler uh, iteration, if you will, of the Pax Romana system. So Pax Romana, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot going on in there. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to do a demo of that one real soon too. But uh, with Genesis, it, there's there's less moving parts. It's a great game, but it's not nearly as complex, in my opinion, as Pax Romana. So if you're turned off by the complexity of the Pax Romana game, this might be your ticket. So what I've done here is I've gone ahead, like I said, I set up the, the grand campaign. There are 10 turns, conceivably, for the whole campaign here. Um, there are five players. Uh, you can play with fewer than that, but uh, I've set up the five-player uh, scenario and uh, basically everything is ready to go and take you through how the game works. First of all, let me just take you around and show you some of the pieces to give you an idea of what we're dealing with here. Uh, basically, there are two kinds of units in the game. You have infantry, like you see here in Egypt in Tanis. There are ten infantry points. Uh, there's one in Sais. There's one in Memphis, and uh, there's one in Thebes here. So that's your that's your staple run of the mill uh, fighting units. All right. Now there are also second type of unit are chariots, and chariots are a lot like cavalry. If you played Pax Romana, uh, chariots are a lot like cavalry, but I think they have a deeper impact on this game than even cavalry has in in. Pax Romana. Uh, in other words, there's strength points like this is like worth one battle point. Uh, indicated by the number one here. There's the 10 infantry. Infantry are worth one battle point each, so that's 10 battle points. But here's the thing. Each player has a player display, and on that player display there is a chariot tech level. Right now, no chariots are allowed, so you can't even build them yet. But once a card is played that, that uh, gives chariot technology, that player will have chariot technology level one. The next player, it could be some other player that plays a chariot card, they're going to immediately go to chariot tech level equal to the number of chariot cards played thus far in the game. So he would immediately jump from no chariots to chariot level 2. And then the third one would jump to chariot level 3. So uh, basically these are technological advances. But at the end of every turn, once all the players have taken all their activations for the turn, at the very end of the turn, everybody equalizes their chariot tech level to the highest level attained thus far by a single player. So everyone will eventually catch up. But playing the tech cards does allow you to get a temporary advantage on another player. This technological uh, level also impacts the strength points of the chariot themselves. The chariot battle points are multiplied by the tech level. So if you're tech level one, that whatever battle points the counter says, that's how many points it's worth in a battle. But if you're ter chariot tech level two, now each battle point's worth two point, or each strength point's worth two battle points. So this one chariot be worth two battle points, twice as effective as your infantry, in other words. Uh, and then three, each each chariot's worth three uh, tech points and so forth. Chariots are very expensive to uh, to operate and maintain, but they do have a high impact on your battles uh, outside of cities. 
All right, that brings us to the map now. Let's go ahead and delete this guy. The map is composed mostly of cities. So if you look around the map, uh, you'll see that there are circular spaces. Uh, some circles have a circle within a circle, like Gaza. You'll see it differs from Elat. Elat is just a basic circle. Uh, what, what, what you're dealing with here is all of these are cities, okay? But some of them have higher defensive values than others. Squares, again, the same thing. Those are cities. The only difference between Jerusalem and Gaza, for example, is that Jerusalem is, has more uh, wall strength points. So the fortifications are stronger there. Uh, I'll show you another one. Karkamesh uh, has a square within a square, which is even a stronger fortification. And I think Babylon is the strongest one in the game. You'll see it's got like the square within a square and then squares around the corners. So that is the strongest level of fortification. How strong are these? Well, that's given right up here on the terrain key. You'll see that a basic circle is worth one defensive strength point. Circle within a circle is two. A basic square is three points. Uh, square within a square is four. And Babylon uh, and Troy are worth five strength points in defense. Defense only. You can't go attacking with your city. Okay, so those are your, that, that's basically what's going on with cities. These are transit points. They're unfortified. So these little dots, they don't do anything except allow you to pass through on your way. You can also stop there. Unlike um, in Pax Romana, you are allowed to stop here and you can even build cities in these uh, un, unbuilt up areas in this game. So there's a few differences there from Pax Romana. Around each city there are these little yellow dots and sometimes the absence of one like here with an X through it. What that is is the economic worth or EW of each city. And so that's where your income is going to come from. So you're going to you're going to collect money basically from these cities. So Thebes is worth 4, Memphis 4, Tinus 3, Sais 2, Heliopolis 2 and so forth. So Egypt begins with a base income of 4, 8, 11, 13, 15. So they're always going to get those 15 points provided that they control their main kingdom. This is their home kingdom by the way. The the colors of the spaces are, are coded to the different kingdoms in the game. So what you have here is this is the kingdom of Egypt. The yellow spaces are their home areas. They will control it as long as nobody else has a unit in that space. So you don't have to actually occupy it to control it. This is basically a defensive setup just in case the Libyan barbarians would show up. We didn't want them running rampage through, uh, through the delta there. If you look up here at the uh, Hittite kingdom, uh, the blue spaces here, that's their home kingdom spaces. And then the Mitanni are the green home spaces. Syria is the purple. Dark green is Babylon down here. There are minor kingdoms in the game that also have their home spaces, like Elam, uh, the Canaanite cities of Katna, Kadesh, uh, Megiddo, and Hatsor. Then you have the uh, Arzawa uh, minor kingdom over here, which are the orange uh, spaces. So the gray spaces, they're uncontrolled. They are defended, so you do have to attack them in order to capture them. And in order to control them, you have to garrison it with either one of your military units or like I'm going to show you now, your non-military units. That's right, you have some non-military units in the game. They move around like your military units do, but they don't, ha they don't have any uh, battle ability. And in fact, if you're forced to retreat, they can't even retreat with you or withdraw with you, so uh, they just get gobbled up. So these are peasants. Peasants have a black number showing their strength, and they're not encased in a, in a black box like this. So you can easily see military units have a white number and a black oval. Uh, Non-military just have their strength in a, a basic number. Then you have slaves. And the only function of these, these units is to, uh, is to do construction. So building up cities, repairing city defenses, building monuments. Uh, peasants have an additional ability. They can control territory. So you can leave a peasant, say, in Gaza, and that'll, that'll maintain control. Slaves have no ability to maintain control. They are only, uh, in fact, if you leave them without, without uh, military presence, they will simply disappear. So you have to maintain some guards for your slaves. Slaves are acquired in battle. Whenever you uh, defeat 
uh, an opponent in battle and an infantry unit is eliminated or a chariot unit is eliminated, you can go ahead and take uh, one slave from your counter mix and place it into the space where the battle took place. Uh, peasants are created during the uh, the recruitment phase of the game, uh, at the towards the beginning of each turn. Uh, what you can do is you can you can convert your infantry into peasants. One infantry converts into two peasants, and so that is a way to to get peasants. It is the only way actually to get peasants in the game. So those are the units. That's the map. Um, I haven't talked about the leaders yet. Every faction has 10 kings. I know Egypt has pharaohs, but we're going to call them kings. So every faction has 10 kings, and at the beginning of the game, you can decide to either go with the, in the historic order, or you can be fun and do the random order. I prefer, as you can tell, the random order. I think that that provides more excitement in the game. Because uh, you really don't know what you're going to end up with. Uh, some of these kings are really good. Some of them are really <laughs> not so good, as you'll see here in just a moment. Uh, this guy here is what we drew for Egypt, um, Pharaoh Kamos, and he has three numbers around his counter. On the upper left, there's the number four, and that is the turn order of appearance. If you're doing the historic order, he would be the guy that shows up on turn four. Uh, the number in the upper right-hand corner, the three, that's the black number in the gray oval, that is his uh, his battle rating. That's his, uh, his rating for, for battles, whether it be uh, uh, against a city or a field battle. That's his, his rating. The higher that number, the better he is. Basically, the higher any of these numbers are, the better they are. Uh, the number in the red... Uh, and the red number in the gray oval, that is his uh, his campaign rating or his strategy rating rather. Um, I should probably actually get this right. Tactical is actually what they call the top number. So he's a tactical three and that's used in battle. And he's a campaign level three and that's used for movement, for interception, things like that. So the higher that number, the more he can do in, in, in each round. So... Uh, that's the, the pharaoh here in Egypt. We'll go ahead and delete these two guys. Take up here to show you who we got for the Hittites. And we have this guy here whose name I'm not going to try to pronounce. Okay, what's the fun at? Tudhaliya or something like that? Yeah. Tudhaliya the second. Wow, they actually named someone Tudhaliya and then they did it again. So <laughs> this is Tudhaliya the second. And he has, as his name would suggest, a tactical rating of zero, but he does have a campaign rating of two, so he will be able to schlep some guys around the board. He just <laughs> he's just not going to be very good in battle, that's all. All right, the Mitanni, this guy's a little bit better, and his name is more impressive. Uh, Was it Arthashumara? Arthashumara, uh, no first or second on this guy. He's the only Arthashumara in the game, and. Uh, He's ready to thrash Amara somebody. Anyways, he's got a tactic rating of 1, strategy rating of 2, and he's poised to put the herd on the mines here at Ergani. By the way, that's what this symbol here represents on the map. That's a mine. It doesn't have any function except as cards interact. There's, there's a card that gives you uh, extra money if you, are, uh, if you have a line of, uh, of trade to a, uh, to a mine space that you control. So anyways... That's what these little symbols are. And most of them are in like the Asia Minor area uh, and over here in Assyria. Uh, these little mountain symbols, by the way, those are mountains. It costs two, it costs extra movement points to move in those. We'll talk about that when we get to movement. All right, let's look at the Assyrian king. Who we got here? We have Labaya. Labaya is very insignificant. Tactical ones, campaign rating one. And then we have Agam the third. So yeah. Agam the third, he's got tactical rating two, which is you know pretty good, not as good as the Pharaoh, but close, and he's got a campaign rating of three. So those are the units. That's the map. Let's go ahead and um, just look at the sequence of play real quick here, so we can start pushing some stuff around. Uh, first thing that you do in a turn is there's a succession phase, and we're going to skip this on turn one, but let me just explain it real quick, because what we do is all the kings that are on the map get removed, and they're gone. They're gone forever. Only like generic kings, and they're only like for the minor kingdoms, 
uh, will actually be able to be reused turn after turn. So, and those those kings only come into play by way of cards in the game. So that's you know we're going to skip the succession phase, but that's how you're going to get new kings. Every turn you're going to have a new uh, leader, and it's a little bit different from Pax Romana because you only get one of these guys. If he gets assassinated, well, you're just out, you know out of luck until next turn. Um, you can you know still move armies around without a king. It's just they move really slow and they're not very good in battle. Next thing you do is you do the initiative phase. And what you do here is you look at the campaign rating, the number on the bottom, and you look at who's got the highest campaign rating, and that's the player that's going to go first, and then you just go clockwise around the table from there. So right now there's a tie between the Pharaoh here, Kamos, and Agam from Babylon. They both have a rating of 3, so we'll, we'll just roll a die to see who goes first. Uh, say a 1 through 3, it's the Pharaoh, and 1 it is. So the Pharaoh is going to go first, so we'll go ahead and take one action marker for each of the factions, each of the players in the game, and we're going to go clockwise, which in Vassal I would just take to mean from left to right along uh, this order up here. So it'll be Egypt followed by the Hittites, the Mitanni, Syria, and then Babylon. And then, uh, so everybody's going to get one round, if you will, and then after that, then we draw uh, action markers from this random draw cup so it'll everything will be randomized after that so everyone will get a turn first and after that then it gets kind of crazy and once everybody has used up all the action markers that will that will end the activation round um, of, of a turn that's that's basically the heart of each turn all right so we're in the initiative phase we determine the initiative uh, then we go to a wealth phase that we're going to skip on turn one, but this is where you collect money from your cities. So you get the the in the in terms of money, you get one money for each uh, economic worth. So Egypt would collect 15 right now, and then for whatever cities that you control that aren't a part of your home kingdom, you also collect for them, provided that there is a line uh, of trade, a trade route of controlled spaces or transit spaces uninterrupted by barbarians or enemy uh, units. Um, basically it's a line of supply if you will back to your capital space and that's the space with the star if you lose control of your capital you can change it to another location and there's a counter to designate that so that's what's going on with these capital spaces you don't want to lose the capital space basically uh, once that's done uh, you can collect tribute which is a way to double dip on, on cities that you have already conquered uh, in other words outside of your home kingdom you can demand tribute so you can, up to the economic worth of that city, you can demand tribute. So from Jerusalem, we can demand up to two money. You don't have to take the maximum. In fact, the more you try to take, the more likely it is that they will try to revolt. And so if you don't have enough military units guarding the city, um, they can revolt, and then you can, you'll can you have to go and suppress the revolt to regain uh, your military units there, and the economic situation of the city will be in jeopardy. So... That's a, kind of a cool thing in the game. You kind of uh, have to decide how much do I want to risk here? How much money do I really need from these guys? That kind of thing. And we'll talk about that in a, in a later demo. But that's the wealth phase. Then you have the manpower phase that we're also going to skip on turn one. But basically you're going to roll on a table to find out if your manpower goes up. Uh, or here is a – let me show you the uh, – the little kingdom display for Egypt, for example, everyone has a manpower max, and it starts at a predetermined level. It's different for each faction. Egypt starts with a manpower level of 18, so conceivably next turn it could go up. Uh, there's a 1 in 6 chance, provided you haven't lost any of your home kingdom spaces, there's only a 1 in 6 chance that you'll have no manpower growth. Uh, you could grow anywhere from 1, 2, or 3 every turn on the manpower display. So what you do is say say Egypt grew by one. Then what you would do is you would look at how many infantry units you don't you just ignore peasants, but you look at your infantry units and they got 10, 11, 12, 13. Uh, so they could have up to 19 uh, manpower. Their max is is 19. If you're over your max, then you have to reduce your infantry down to your manpower maximum. But if you're under your maximum, then you get free infantry up to your maximum. So Egypt basically get to build six six guys for free. It doesn't cost you a cent. So how do, how do you beat a deal like that, right? 
maintenance. You have to pay maintenance for chariots. There's no chariots now, but if you do have chariots, you have to pay three money to maintain them. They're a lot like fleets uh, were in Pax Romana. You have to pay maintenance on it. Three money to retain chariots, uh, and that's also when you would remove your excess infantry. Uh, then you can raise new units, your infantry. Like I said, you get them for free up to your manpower maximum. You cannot build in, in excess of your maximum during this time. Uh, you can raise new chariots. They're five money to build a new one, so they're very expensive. Uh, net income right now of, of Egypt is like 15 money, so it's a third of their, their net income just to build one chariot. So they're very expensive to get. Uh, then you have then after you've done the manpower phase you go into the activation phase which is what we're heading to here after that you check to see if anyone's isolated there's an isolation phase that's once all the activation markers have been resolved then there's an isolation phase uh, barbarians get removed from the game uh, your capital can be relocated uh, if there's any alliances formed by way of a card those are just uh, dissolved basically uh, then you go to the end turn phase where cha chariot technology is all brought up to the highest level attained by any single player. And then the, the victory points are adjusted. You just basically count up the number of economic worth uh, controlled by each kingdom. And then you add one for each monument that they built. And that's how many victory points they get. And that is tracked on this display here. So you can see Egypt starts with 15 uh, victory points, which is how much money that they're getting each turn. So, all right, then you discard your. If, there are cards that you can get in the game, and you can hold up the three of them in your hand during a round. But at the end of the turn, you have to discard down to one card, and then the deck is reshuffled, and you're ready to go from there. So that's just a real basic overview of how play works, the map, the pieces. Um, what I'll do in the next video is I'll take you through a turn and uh, we'll, uh, we'll start pushing some pieces around and, and seeing how the different mechanics of the game work.